So when I first started having conversations with families from, you know, different walks of life, that's when I came to understand that there is a common bond that we all share, that we're all really seeking the same things. And knowing that that thing was happiness came from the show. And every day I would sit and talk with the audience for a half hour, sometimes 40 minutes, a producer would be like, oh my God, when is she gonna let go of the audience? What I really want is to have a conversation with the audience to see why did you come and what did you get from the show and did you benefit at all and why do you watch, all of that. So 10 years in, the audience became my focus group. I would always ask people, what do you want? What would it take to make you happy? And most people, when I'd say, what do you want? They'd just say, I just want to be happy. Tell me what that looks like. And as the years progressed, women were more able to identify what that specifically was. But when I first started asking that question in the mid 90s, they would always just say, well, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Well, what does that look like? Define it. Define, define happy. Define it. And, and what I realize is that most people have never defined it. And then they'd say, well, I want my kids to be happy. Well, that's your kids, but what do you want? And so being able to answer specifically what that looks like for you is the beginning of being happier. I know this, that many of the things that have happened to you have also happened for you. And that I learned when the crisis or the challenge showed up for me, I immediately would ask, sometimes out loud, but certainly in my own conscious spirit, what is this here to teach me? And how can I get that lesson as soon as possible? And this I guarantee you, the moment you have the conscious realization of, oh, this is why this is here, showing up to allow me to see whatever that is in your life, it changes for you. Unhappiness is not the enemy. No, it is not the enemy. The unhappiness, and if actually one of the things that's so powerful, I think about uh, what Arthur has written specifically is about how your emotions are there to allow you to feel the feel and then take the wheel of this feeling that I'm having. I'm having this feeling and now I need to do what? And not to allow yourself to be overcome by the feeling. So you have a feeling of anger, you have a feeling of sadness, you have a feeling of disappointment. Doesn't mean you are those things, you are those emotions. So now what am I gonna do now that I'm feeling disappointed about a certain thing? You say happiness is not a destination, happiness is a direction. I know that was a shift in mindset for many who are reading this book. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, and you know, this is, the, the problem with happiness is such a funny thing because we all want it. Every philosopher and theologian has talked about it. Everybody, I mean, how, how, how many times have people said that on your show? I know, that's what I say in the beginning of the book that- Thousands know, of times. Well, I became interested in the subject because every time I would sit with the audience and I'd say, what do you want? Everybody would always say. Multiple people would answer, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Yeah. But yet when you ask them, what does that look like for them? Hard to define. For sure. And part of the reason is because it's not something that you can define in any meaningful way. We think it's a feeling. We think it's a destination. Mm -hmm. It isn't either. It, you know, happy feelings are nothing more than emotions and emotions are nothing more than information that we need in reaction to the outside environment. And, and as a destination, what would you, why would you want to be completely happy as the destination? You'd be dead in a week because you actually need negative emotions and experiences to train you, to keep you vigilant, to keep you safe and to be happy. Yeah, to keep you alert, to keep you, to keep you on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, maybe when I die and I'm in heaven, and I see the face of God, the beatific vision will be pure happiness. But on earth, I'm telling you, I need my negative emotions mm -hmm. to keep me alive and safe. I need my negative experiences to learn and grow. And so that's what people, they, they want to stay alive and safe, uh -huh. but they don't want the feelings that keep them alive and safe. And yeah. that's this conflict that they have, which is why they feel so unsettled. Okay, so I think, particularly in this world of social media, people think if I just get that, 
I mean, I, I, I see people toasting on private jets and I see them, you know, on beaches and, right. you know, hair, their hair blowing in the wind and all that. And people think, well, if I just had that, I, I could be happy. But we know, you yeah. have the science to back it up, that there are really four pillars. And if you right. don't have all of those pillars working in your life, you will eventually end up feeling not necessarily sad but lonely or distanced or disconnected that's right so the four pillars yeah are. the four pillars there's there's kind of the four pillars you think that you need and those four pillars that you really do need the idols the things that look right but aren't are money yes. power pleasure and fame those are the things that mother nature says you get those you're gonna be happy money power pleasure and fame that's right but she lies mother nature lies she lies a lot because she wants us to keep running 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 yeah. right because but is my, mother nature telling us that or is society telling us that? because well, i think mother nature is telling us the, that it's the four pillars well mother nature gives us these imperatives because she wants us to wants us to be hungry you know and and she wants us to survive and pass on our genes yes and the way that you do that is with money power pleasure and fame Right. And she doesn't want us to figure out that those things never really satisfy so that we'll keep running and running and running. That's called the hedonic treadmill. Like that. What we really want, and this is backed up by, by, by a lot of psychology, neuroscience, behavioral economics, all the research that we want, mm -hmm. is that there's kind of four things that are the virtuous things that we should be looking for. The Mother Nature doesn't necessarily tell us, but that if we take the divine path in life, mm -hmm. religious or not religiously understood, a better path in life, mm -hmm. we'll be happy. And those are our faith, family, friends, and work that serves. Now, if you give any teenage kid the choice between money, power, pleasure, and honor, or faith, faith family, family friends, you know, good and friends, work. and good times, and a yeah. work that serves others, I mean, They're what gonna, are they gonna take? Yeah. Right? I mean, our society does aid and abet Mother Nature's lie. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the marketing colossus tells us that if you get that car, man, you're gonna be really happy. If you get that job, you get that money. If you get that 100,000 Instagram followers or whatever your number happens to be, it's never yeah. high enough, by the yeah. way, you're going to be happy. But that's a lie is the bottom. There's nothing wrong with those things. Yeah. But if you get those things, if we are so lucky to get those things, they should only ever be in service of the big four, the good four. They should only ever be in service. They should be intermediate goals, a rest stop on the New Jersey mm -hmm. Turnpike, Manhattan, where you're trying mm -hmm. to get is faith, faith. And by that, yeah. yeah. How do you use that money, power, pleasure, and fame to enhance your faith, family, and work? And friendship. And friendships. How Basically, you your yeah. love. Yes, your the love. The love in your life. Yeah. And the love in the lives of the people around you. That's yeah. really what those, those worldly goals should be used for if you want to have any shot at true happiness. Yeah. My question is for you, Oprah. I'm wondering how, as you've gotten older, your approach to getting happier has changed. I like that question. Eric, because as I've gotten older, and one of the reasons why I was so excited about working with Arthur here is because Arthur, you confirmed my belief system. So I have been, I have known since I was a kid that life is better when you share it. Yeah. And I learned that with my first Three Musketeers bar because growing up poor, I so seldom got candy. I would save it until like, cousins came by so because it tasted better when I could share it yeah. and now I know Eric that that is one of the principles of enjoyment which is what actually defines happiness yeah. enjoyment satisfaction and purpose exactly right. and so being able so so to answer your question I would say that now that I know that the science actually backs me up on life is better when you share it I want to share it more. So it used to be, I would just love doing a random act of kindness or doing something, you know, meaningful for somebody that would help them in their lives or enhance their lives. Now I make it a habit. Yeah. It's a part of my spiritual practice mm -hmm. to include the enjoyment for myself of making other people happier. So I would say, as I've gotten older, that's what I've actually learned about yeah. how to enjoy happiness, uh, not just for myself, but how to spread it to other people. Yeah. All right, so let's explore this then through the lens of creating one's own perfect life. Yes. Which is pretty interesting, especially because, and 
interesting because I think this is so accurate to the way that most people are. It's not like, oh, there's some grand missing thing in my life, but you took that first action. So codify this for me or, or for anybody that wants, to, they don't know what their ideal life looks like, they just know that they're not living it yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, step number one is take it seriously. To find out if the hypothesis is true or not, you have to take the, um, the, the experiment, you have to do it sincerely. Mm -hmm. um, what comes after that? I think even one step before that is, is opening yourself up to new role models and new experiences. See, we live in echo chambers. We're just surrounded by the same thinking. How often do you bump into a monk? You know, it just doesn't happen. You don't have, no one has a dinner party and goes, oh yeah, we just invited the monk, you know, from town, like the local monk. Like no one ever does that. And so we meet people who are just like us most of the time. And we talk about this in business all the time. If you want to be a billionaire, spend time with billionaires. If you want to be a millionaire, spend time with millionaires. If you want to be a tech startup, spend time with, you know, that's, that's the common rhetoric that we hear all the time. But what if you want to find purpose and master the mind? There's no one better than a monk who's mastered the mind. So, so for me, the first step is just opening yourself up to new experiences and new role models. Because most of us can't see ourselves in people, so then we try and fit ourselves into the boxes that we do see. And, and I mean, there's this beautiful quote that I, I've been saying it everywhere and I wish I wrote it, but I didn't. So it's by a philosopher and writer named Cooley. And he said that today, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Right? And just let that blow your mind for a moment. It's, uh, it's so powerful. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So we live in this perception of a perception of ourselves. Hence, my identity is made by what my parents think I should be. My identity is made up by what my college or university thinks I should achieve. While you're living in that bubble and that echo chamber, getting to what you really want to do is impossible because maybe that just doesn't fit. And I think so many people feel that way today, that they don't fit into the current education system. They don't fit with the three or four or five careers that you're taught exist. So that process of self-excavation and actualization first requires being exposed. You can't be what you can't see. If I never saw a monk, I would never have wanted to be a monk. If I never meet a billionaire, I wouldn't want to be one because I wouldn't know what that feels like. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it takes. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge of our society, that we're not exposed. So that's the first step, being exposed to unique experiences and role models. Second step is finding that experience or role model that you're passionate about. And exactly like you said, taking it seriously, shadow them, network with them, spend time with them, observe them, even from afar. It takes that observation, being addicted to observing that person's lifestyle. And then the third step is going yes or no. Does that work for me? Not everyone who's gonna go off and become a monk is gonna feel like the way I did, and that's cool. But not everyone is gonna go and follow and shadow a billionaire and go, that's exactly the lifestyle I want. They may want the result, but do they want the hard work that goes with it? And so for me, that's the third step. It's observing, focusing, shadowing, getting as close to the process of that individual, and then going yes or no. Do I want that process? Not do I want the result? Everyone wants to be that monk who's fully enlightened, you know, can walk through, has an incredible aura that people just gravitate towards. But when you realize he has to wake up at 2 a.m. every day and sleeps about four to six hours, you're like, ah, you know, I don't want to do it. <laughs> that, that doesn't sound like me. So, yeah. All right. So I studied behavioral science at university, so I've always been fascinated by why people do what they do. And whenever I was reading these books that are 5,000 years old, my greatest fascination was finding a principle and finding its relevance in modern science. And I said to myself, the day I can't find that, I'll quit. I won't believe in this anymore. So I'm still doing that and I'm ready to quit. If someone shows me a piece of science and I can't find a principle in these ancient literatures, or actually what I like to call these timeless literatures, then I'll give up my faith because for me, it has to track forward. And I'll give you a really basic example. Today we're in the gratitude movement. There's like a million gratitude journals out there. There's a million scientific studies on gratitude and gratitude has been linked to better mental health, self-awareness, better relationships. I mean, there's so many scientific studies on the, on the neuro level that shows that gratitude is great for your mind, brain and fulfillment. 
Now, I look back, and like gratitude is all over the timeless wisdom. One of the first things we were trained to do when we were a monk was to pay our respects to the earth for what it gives us. And you do that first thing in the morning. What is that if not gratitude? When you wake up in the morning, you thank the earth for the food. You thank the earth for the water. You thank the earth for allowing yourself to walk. You start your day with gratitude. Today, the biggest tip on Forbes and Inc. and everything is start your day with gratitude. Like, where does it come from? It's, it's right there. These things are old. So I, I get fascinated. I'm intrigued by the parallels and patterns because it saves you time. It's the same way as which if I say that this business person got invested by this company and that's why they're successful because they had the right investors, etc. That's a pattern. So I know if I'm building a business in that area, I'm going to look for investors like that. It's the same thing. That pattern saves you time rather than you trying to figure out, does gratitude work? How shall I be grateful? Creating your own process almost. I had one mentor uh, that my brother introduced me to. His name was Alan Brown. He was a very successful philanthropist, entrepreneur, and he agreed to meet with me for lunch one day. And this one man in one minute, in one meeting, changed my life. Because he asked me, what, what goals do you have? And I said, what, what do you mean, what goals do I have? I said, I want to you know, go out this weekend to the bar. I want to have some good food. I want to find a nice young lady to maybe hook up with. And he says, no, no, but what are your bigger goals? And I didn't have any. So he actually sent me home. And he said, fill out these pieces of paper. And on the pieces of paper, it said, like, what age do you want to retire by? Like, I was 19. This was May of 1980. I wasn't even started yet. They said, but just fill out, fill out these papers. So I said, I want to retire by the time I'm 45 with $3 million. I want to have a Mercedes. I want to have a house. I want to travel the world. I want to have a great lifestyle. And so I came back on Monday and he looked at it and he asked me one question. And that question transformed my life. And he said, are you interested in achieving these goals or are you committed? And I stopped and I, and I looked at him. He was standing up. I was sitting at my desk there at his office, and I asked him, Mr. Brown, I said, what's the difference? And he said, if you're interested, you'll do what's convenient. You'll come up with stories and excuses and reasons why you can't, and you'll use your education as an excuse, you'll use your story as an excuse, you'll use the fact your father was a cab driver and was a gambler and never had any money. You'll use all of that as your reasons why you can't. He says, but if you're committed, you will do whatever it takes. You'll let go of your stories. You'll let go of your excuses. You'll let go of all the reasons you currently have that are formulating your identity of yourself. And you'll learn how to let that go and become who you are destined to become. When I came back that following couple of days with my goals, and he asked me, committed or interested? I said, I'm committed, shook, shook my hand. He then put me through real estate school for five weeks. I graduated from real estate school May 20th, 1980. And the only reason those dates are ingrained in my brain, I passed the real estate test on my own without cheating. So that was step one. When I came back to the office, he had the forms that I'd filled out. He says, great, sit down. So I want you to read every one of them every morning that you come in the office at 7.30 and I want you to run your fingers across them. Were these the goals or the beliefs? Those are the goals, the okay. goals that I had. So he had me write my vision for health, wealth, relationships, career, business, finances, charity, fun, experiences, everything, every area of my life. He had these documents. He said, I want you to read them every day and you're gonna do it while you come into the office so that I know that you've done them. And I want, to I want you to run your fingers across them as you're reading them. And then when you're finished one paragraph, close your eyes and I want you to feel, what would it be like if that was true? So he got me to see it to touch it, to close my eyes and visualize it and to feel it. So at the time he didn't understand what he was really doing, but he was causing me to create new neural patterns in my brain that did not exist before. The only success that I'd ever really seen was on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And I said, one day, I want a life like that. And, um, and so every single day for a year, I had to do that. And it only took 10 or 15 minutes. And there was also beliefs. You talked about um, what else was in there. He also asked me to write down, what would you have to believe about yourself in order to achieve those goals? I said, well, I'd have to believe I'm smart enough, but I don't. He goes, I don't want to know what you don't. He says, what would you have to believe? Well, I have to believe I'm smart enough. 
I'd have to believe I'm deserving enough. I'd have to believe I'm worthy enough. I'd have to believe I'm capable of doing this. I'd have to believe these things. I wrote, wrote out a bunch of things and he added a few more. He says, great, now I want you to record those things. And on your way to work, and on your drive to look at real estate homes, because 19 getting into real estate, you listen to those over and over and over and over and over again until you can recite every single one of them. So he taught me the power of repetition. He taught me the power of looking at stuff, touching stuff, feeling stuff, seeing stuff, hearing stuff, memorizing stuff. And at the time I was 19, I said, I mean, I felt this was fucking ludicrous to me, right? This is like, what the hell am I doing here? It's like, it was like, it was nuts. But that first year at 19, I made like 30 some odd thousand dollars, which was five grand more than my dad made as a cab driver. I said, something's working. And I just kept doing it. I was too afraid not to. So I kept doing it. And the second year, I made $151,000. Five times. Now, in the second year, he started upgrading my knowledge and skills more. So he started to say, okay, instead of doing this now, now you're, you've graduated to doing this. And he taught me some upgraded skills. And so the combination of training my brain at a young age with beliefs that I wanted to have, he taught me the right habits to have, daily rituals, you know, for goal achievement versus goal setting. That's interesting. Right? So he said, everybody sets goals. Either they write them down or they don't, they have them in their head. But I'm gonna teach you how to achieve goals. And you said, this is so cool, you were talking about how you wrote down these beliefs and you were reading them over and you were doing what you were told and you were running your finger across it, you were really allowing yourself to feel it, imagine it, and your brain was screaming something at you. My brain was screaming, that's bullshit. <laughs> that's not true. You're not successful. You're not earning that amount of money. You're not smart. You're not this. But I was also taught at the same time that when that happens, first and foremost, that's normal. That's the old self and the old patterns trying to fight for their life. And he said, with repetition and emotion and consistency, initially it's hard and you have to use conscious effort to create the new beliefs. He says, but over 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 180 days, that new pattern that you're focusing on and paying attention to, your brain basically says, well, I guess you really don't need those old patterns. You keep activating these new ones. Let's just make these ones work and let's make these real. But I want to understand what happened. And, and with the, even the law of attraction, you know, the, I was taught the law of attraction, you know, I was 23, 24 years old. Um, also at a real estate conference, they're talking about this law of attraction thing that there's this energy, everything's made up of energy. I am energy, you are energy. And my thoughts, you know, create this resonance between what I attract and what I don't. I'm like, oh good, I like that shit. You know, like I, I wanna attract more of the good stuff, right? And so I, I, I bought in, like I bought into stuff that just made sense to me, but then I was a voracious student. I want to understand how. Explain to me how it works. Like, if somebody tells me visualize, I go, why? Like, how does it work? Like, if you ask me to visualize, like, why does it work? Like, why should I invest my time on that versus something else? If you're asking me to um, use affirmations, like, how specifically, why, how does it work? If you're asking me to emotionalize, well, what's happening in me that tell me I need to create these false senses of feelings? I wanna know why it works. And why does it work, especially emotionalizing? I think that's something that people hear a lot. I talk a lot about yeah. embodying something, really feeling it. Yeah. But why does it work? Great, great question. It has to do with circuits in the brain and neurochemicals that are released. And so when we feel something, chances are that we're gonna release dopamine in the brain, the feel good uh, neurochemical that activates the reward center of the brain. And chances are if we feel that and we have this positive emotion around it and that neurochemistry is flooding our brain and our body with feel-good chemicals, we're actually activating the motivational center of the brain. And so when we visualize, when we set a goal, when we take an action step, when we emotionalize, when we read our goals, the initial flood of neurochemicals dopamine, serotonin, feel-good chemicals, and then if we share it with a friend, oxytocin, those three neurochemicals, those are the neurochemicals of goal achievement. 
But then there's the other side of it, the other circuits of fear, of stress, where norepinephrine, cortisol, or epinephrine, the stress hormones can be released as well. And so I'm fascinated and I wanna teach people the stuff that we've learned about beliefs, self-esteem, self-worth, fears, and the stuff that really holds people back. Because all the how-to, how to get healthy and stay healthy, we know. How do I build a business and sustain? We know. How do I get into a relationship and make it successful? We know. We, we know most of the how-to for anything that anybody wants to do in this time frame that we live in. So the how-to is the easiest part of the equation. So the harder part of the equation is why am I not doing the things that I know I should be doing? And why am I not doing the things that I could find out easily how to do? I wanted to figure out if the stuff that I did in the 80s when I was a kid, you know, that broke free, would it work with some of my agents? And so we took 75 agents, randomly agents said, hey, do you want to get into a six month program to like retrain your brain, your subconscious brain around your beliefs about what is possible for you to achieve, around your habits of what you have to do in order to achieve that. And we focused on retraining their subconscious mind. And so for six months, they had to go through a process of listening to certain audio tapes, reading, reading certain materials every day, and following the process of training their brain, specifically their subconscious brain, which controls 95 to 98% of all of our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors today. And within six months, that group increased sales by $100 million. Jesus. $100 million. And I said, holy shit, right? This is working. And so we started to teach some of what we teach now in Neurogym. Actually, now we have the technologies, we have the systems that are far better than what we did back in the 90s. And we went from 1.2 billion to 4.5 billion a year. And it wasn't because we taught them any more skills to be real estate agents. Mm. We taught them how to change the way they thought about themselves. We taught them how to change their habits. Here are a few things I want you to know that I know for sure. Don't be afraid. All you have to know is who you are because there is no such thing as failure. There is no such thing as failure. What other people label or might try to call failure, I have learned is just God's way of pointing you in a new direction. So it's true, you may take several paths that end up on what might be a dead end for you at the moment. But this is what I also know for sure. You must trust in the words of my favorite Bible verse that say, and know that the, the Lord will lead you to a rock that is higher than thou. Every one of us has a calling. There is a reason why you are here. I know this for sure. And that reason is greater than any degree. It's greater than any paycheck. And it's greater than anything anybody can tell you that you're supposed to do. Your real job is to find out what the reason is, and get about the business of doing it. Your calling isn't something that somebody can tell you about. It's what you feel. It is a part of your life force. It is the thing that gives you juice, the thing that you're supposed to do. And nobody can tell you what that is. You know it inside yourself. You know, I come from good stock. Dr. Swigert was mentioning my grandmother who had a dream for me and her dream was not a big dream. Her dream was that one day she used to say, I want you to grow up and get yourself some good white folks. Because my grandmother was a maid and she worked for white folks her whole life. And her idea of having a big dream was to, was to have white folks who at least treated her with some dignity, who showed her a little bit respect. And I regret that she didn't live past 1963 to see that I did grow up and get some really good white folks working for me. So have no fear. Have no fear, God's got your back. And sometimes, sometimes you find out what you're supposed to be doing by doing the things you're not supposed to do. So don't expect the perfect job that defines your life's work to come along next week. If that happens, take the blessing and run with it. But if not, be grateful to be on the path where you eventually want to live. 
Abide in the space of gratitude, because this is what I know for sure, that only through being grateful for how far you've come in your path can you leave room for more blessings to flow. Blessings flow in the space of gratitude. Everything in your life is happening to teach you more about yourself. So even in a crisis, be grateful. When disappointed, be grateful. When things aren't going the way you want them to, be grateful that you have sense enough to turn it around. And so I try to live in the space of God's dream. And the television executives told me when I was in Baltimore that I was just, it was too much. I was too big and I was too black. They told me that I was too engaged, that I was too emotional, I was too, too much for the news. And so they put me on a talk show one day just to run out my contract. And that was the beginning of my story. Even when things are difficult, be grateful. Honor your calling. Don't worry about how successful you will be. Don't worry about it. Focus on how significant you can be in service and the success will take care of itself. And always take a stand for yourself, your values. You're defined by what you stand for. Your integrity is not for sale. If I could count the number of times I have been asked to compromise and sell out myself for one reason or another, I would be a billionaire 10 times over. My integrity is not for sale and neither is yours. Many times when we were told that we would lose the advertisers, we would lose the ratings, I said, I'm gonna take the high road. They said, you won't be able to survive in this business taking the high road. You won't be able to get the numbers. The advertisers will drop out. And I said, let them, let them. We will chart our own course. We will stand up for what we believe in. And 21 years later, we're still the number one show. Harriet Tubman once said that she could have liberated thousands more if only she could have convinced them that they were slaves. So do not be a slave to any form of selling out. Maintain your integrity. It has always been, I believe, the only solution to all of the problems in the world, and it remains the only solution. The most important lesson I can offer you from my own life is that in order to remain successful, to continue to wear the crown, as you walk the path of privilege, you must not forget the less privilege you've left behind. You cannot continue to succeed in the world or have a fulfilling life in the world unless you choose to use your life in service somehow to others and give back what you have been given. That's how you keep it. That's how you get it. That's how you grow it. And I know when you move through life, living your own truth and live through the paradigm of service, you too will be all right. So I beseech you to go forth and serve Serve first yourself, honor your calling. Do what you're supposed to do. Honor your creator, your family, your ancestors. And when you walk this path of privilege, don't forget the less privilege you leave behind. In sports, you often hear the phrase winning is everything, but in reality, it's not. The questions you have to answer are, am I getting better as a person? And is what I'm doing bringing me and the ones around me happiness? The answers will tell you whether or not you're really winning. After you succeed at something, you expect the skies to open and happiness to rain down on you. But that rarely happens. The truth is victory can be isolating. A lot of it comes down to how you handle pressure. I was 12 years old when I first felt undue pressure from my dad regarding my potential future with tennis. I finally asked my parents, what would make you happy? My father said, a college scholarship and playing for your country. I told them, well, dad, I'm 12. Could you back off for a few years? 
In that moment, I learned no matter who it is, you have to be able to stand up for yourself. Whether it's your father or your boss, be your own best advocate. The worst pressure is the kind you feel internally. Many questions will keep you up at night. Am I good enough? Am I where I should be? My dear friend, the great Billie Jean King will tell you pressure is a privilege. The first time I heard that, I thought she was nuts. Pressure's not a privilege, it's awful. But upon further reflection, I realize she has a point. We're lucky to experience pressure at the highest levels. Life doesn't always go as planned, and sometimes you need to pivot. And the path you end up on can be better than anything you ever imagined. If you know anything about my tennis career, you probably know that I didn't exactly handle pressure in the way people expect. Google John McEnroe Meltdown, and you'll see many YouTube clips of me smashing rackets and shouting choice words at umpires. I'm not proud of it. But I wasn't intentionally trying to be a jerk. I was competing at the highest levels, and I was releasing pressure the only way I knew how, like a valve releasing steam. But there is a better way, trust me. For the longest time, I was not very empathetic to others, and that was probably my biggest flaw. I was wired to win and never let up, not even for a second. I felt like I couldn't enjoy the moment, and worse yet, I was often insensitive to the people around me. I had that edge about me. Again, not a great way to live. But I was lucky that new doors opened in my life which allowed me to find happiness in unexpected ways. I got really into art, made some incredible friendships, built a family. Sometimes you have to appreciate where you're at in life. If your mentality is if it's not success, then it's failure. Your life will be really, really hard. Success gives us another chance to keep plugging away at we, what we love to do. That's all it really is. You're the sum of your whole life, not your professional accomplishments. So start enjoying your life now. Don't wait till your career takes off. When you look at the last few years of my tennis career or my failed talk show or the end of my first marriage or all the various projects that came and went, I stayed in it. I kept trying new things, opening new doors. I learned not to be disillusioned by failure, not to be burdened by perfection, and not to be intimidated by greatness. My final tennis analogy is this. When a ball is coming at you, you have a split second to decide how to return it. You have a handful of options and make the best decision in the moment. Sometimes you win the point, and sometimes it's an endless rally that you lose. But you take your best shot and keep finding the courage to step on the court. This is the time to take your shots. Your life will go by fast. Give it your all. Stand up for yourself. Stay curious. Be a good citizen of the world. Don't get crushed under the weight of your own expectations. Know that the real victory in life is a long game. Measure your success by how much you evolve, not necessarily how much you win. Win or lose, what matters is giving everything you've got. In a truly full life, you'll be lucky to have your share of both victories and defeats. In either case, Keep finding the courage within you to move forward. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is. Your life is just to live your life inside the world. Try not to bash into the walls too much. Uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. 
And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, you can change it, you can mold it. That's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just gonna live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. It's very interesting. I was worth um, about over a million dollars when I was 23 and over $10 million when I was 24 and over $100 million when I was 25. And it's, it wasn't that important uh, because I never did it for the money. I think money is a wonderful thing because it enables you to do things. It enables you to in invest in ideas that don't have a short-term payback and things like that. But especially at that point in my life, it was, it was not the most important thing. The most important thing was the company, the people, the products we were making, what we were going to enable people to do with these products. So I didn't think about it a great deal. You know, I never sold any stock. and just really believed that the company would, would do very well over the long term. Now, I've actually always found something uh, to be very true, which is um, most people don't get those experiences because they'd never ask. I've never found anybody that didn't want to help me if I asked them for help. I always call them up. I called up, this will date me, but I called up Bill Hewlett when I was 12 years old, and he lived in Palo Alto. His number was still in the phone book, and he answered the phone himself. He said, yes? He said, hi, I'm Steve Jobs. I'm 12 years old. I, I'm a, a student in high school, and I want to build a frequency counter. And I was wondering if you had any spare parts I could have. And he laughed and he, he gave me the spare parts to build his frequency counter and he gave me a job that summer in Hewlett Packard, working on the assembly line, putting nuts and bolts together on frequency counters. He got me a job in the place that built them. And I was in heaven. And I've never found anyone who said no or hung up the phone when I called. I just asked. And when people ask me, I try to be as responsive, you know, to pay that debt of gratitude back. Most people never pick up the phone and call. Most people never ask. And that's what separates sometimes the people that do things from the people that just dream about them. You gotta act. And you've gotta be uh, willing to fail. You've gotta be willing to crash and burn. You know, with people on the phone, with starting a company, with whatever. If you're afraid of failing, uh, you won't get very far. A lot of people come to me and they say, well, I wanna be an entrepreneur. And I go, oh, that's great. What's your idea? And they go, well, I don't have one yet. And I say, well, I think you should go get a job as a busboy or something so you find something you're really passionate about because it's a lot of work. And I'm convinced that about half of what separates the successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful ones is pure perseverance. It is so hard. You pour so much of your life into this thing. There are such rough moments in time that most people give up. I don't blame them. I mean, it's really tough. And it consumes your life. I mean, if, you're, if you've got a family and you're in the early days of a company, it's, I can't imagine how one could do it. I'm sure it's, it's been done, but it's rough. I mean, because it's a pretty much, a, you know, an 18 hour a day job, seven days a week for a while. So unless you have a lot of passion about this, you're gonna not survive, you're gonna give it up. So you gotta have an idea or a, a problem or a, a, a wrong that you wanna write that you're passionate about, otherwise, you're not going to have the perseverance to stick it through. And I think that's half the battle right there. My entire life's been spent only in one industry, which is this one. And, uh, but I've been in it now for about 15 years, and I've seen a lot of people make a lot of things. I've seen a lot of people fail a lot of things. And my point of view on this, or my observation is, that the doers are the major thinkers. The people that really create the things that change this industry are both the thinker-doer in one person. And if we really go back and we examine, uh, you know, did, did Leonardo have a guy off to the side that was thinking five years out in the future what he would paint or the technology he would use to paint it? Of course not. Leonardo was the artist, but he also mixed all his own paints. He also was a, a fairly good chemist, knew about pigments, uh, knew about human anatomy, and combining all of those skills together, the art and the science, the thinking and the doing, was what resulted in the exceptional result. 
And there is no difference in our industry. The people that have really made the contributions have been the thinkers and the doers. A lot of people, of course, it's, it's very easy to take credit for the thinking. Uh, the doing is more concrete, but somebody, it's very easy for somebody to say, oh, I thought of this three years ago. But usually when you dig a little deeper, you find that the people that really did it were also the people that really worked through the hard intellectual problems as well. What do you imagine the next 10 years of your life is going to be about? This is probably a bad example, but I'm going to use it. When this whole thing with Gizmodo happened, I got a lot of advice from people that said, you've got to just let it slide. You can't, you shouldn't go after a journalist because they bought stolen property and they tried to extort you. You should let it slide. Apple's a big company now. You don't want the PR. You should let it slide. And I thought deeply about this and I ended up concluding that the worst thing that could possibly happen as we get big and we get a little more influence in the world is if we change our core values and start letting it slide. I can't do that. I'd rather quit. You know, you go back five years ago, what would we have done if something like this happened? You go back 10 years ago, we had the same values now as we had then. Maybe a little more experienced, certainly more beat up, but the core values are the same. And we come into work wanting to do the same thing today as, as we did five or 10 years ago, which is build the best products for people. You know, there's nothing that makes my day more than getting an email from some random person in the universe who just bought an iPad over in the UK and tells me the story about how it's the coolest product they've ever brought home, you know, in their lives. That's what keeps me going. And it's what kept me going five years ago. It's what kept me going 10 years ago when the doors were almost closed. Uh, and it's what will keep me going five years from now, whatever happens. Apple is a company doesn't have the most resources of everybody in the world. And um, the way we've succeeded is by choosing what horses to ride really carefully, technically. We try to look for these technical vectors that, that have a future and that are headed up. And, you know, different pieces of technology kind of go in cycles. They have their, their springs and summers and autumns, and then they, you know, go to the graveyard of technology. So we try to pick things that are in their springs. And if you choose wisely, you can save yourself an enormous amount of work versus trying to do everything. And you can really put energy into making those new emerging technologies be great on your platform rather than just okay because you're spreading yourself too thin. So we have a history of doing that. As an example, uh, we went from the five inch floppy disk to the three and a half inch floppy disk with the Mac. And there were some good reasons we did that. Uh, we got rid of the floppy disk altogether in uh, to 1998 with the first iMac. We also got rid of these things called serial and parallel ports. And we were the first to, to adopt USB, even though Intel had invented it. You first saw it in mass on iMacs. And so we have got rid of things. We were one of the first to get rid of optical drives with the MacBook Air. And uh, I, you know, I think things are moving in that direction as well. And sometimes when we get rid of things like the floppy disk drive on the original iMac, people call us crazy. But sometimes you just have to pick the things that look like they're going to be the right horses to ride going forward. We are who we are. Like I said, we're fully formed by the experiences we have when we're young, you know, at a pretty young age. And now the opportunity life presents us is to make decisions that either keeps us in balance with who we really are or not. And I think one of the reasons most of us feel discomfort or don't feel ourselves or don't know who we are is because we're making decisions that are inconsistent with that true cause, with that why, right? We look for ways to distance ourselves from the impact of our decisions. We say things like, it's what you got to do to get ahead. It's what my boss wants. Um, everyone's doing it. It's the system. I don't have a choice, right? And there are ways we can disassociate our responsibility. 
So you raise the case of individual athletes who become champions and then suffer depression. It's a fairly common story. You hear this from Olympians. You know, Michael Phelps becomes the most medaled Olympian of all time, immediately suffers depression. Andre Agassi becomes the most storied, you know, tennis player of all time, immediately becomes depressed. And what I've learned from talking to some of these, these particularly athletes, but I think it happens in the business world as well, which is from a very young age, they set themselves a goal that, in my words, would be a very selfish goal. I want to be the best at X, the best tennis player, the best golfer, the best whatever. And, you know, the way Olympians put it, which I get a kick out of, is I want to win the Olympics. I'm like, well, no one wins the Olympics. You can be a winner in your sport. And, and their entire lives, from pretty young ages, every decision they're making is to help them advance this finite goal. And all of their relationships are, can you help me achieve my goal? And if you can no longer help me achieve my goal, I don't need you anymore as a coach or even a friend. And there's huge sacrifices, missing of birthdays, missing of Christmases, you know, missing of major life events because I have to practice so I can achieve my goal. And when they get interviewed on the news, you know, or at the Olympics or whatever, you know, why do you do it? And they all say, well, I'm doing it to inspire the little kids, which is complete bullshit. You know, if you look at all of their uh, vision boards from when they were younger, pictures of podiums and medals and money and Lamborghinis, not a single little child on there of the people you're doing it for. It's, it's just a lucky strike extra. I mean, absolutely you do inspire children, but that's not the reason you did it. You just got that, you know, like I said, it's sort of a, it's a twofer. And, and then when they achieve or don't achieve this thing, and then can no longer compete for it. They've set their entire path and all their relationships on this one, these finite selfish goals. And so when it's complete, they realize they don't really have a lot of friends around them. They don't really have a lot of close relationships. They don't really even have a sense of purpose because they've been spent the past 20 years or so with one purpose, which was this finite goal, which now has run out. And so they're very purposeless. And I see this in Broadway performers who set their whole life to be on the West End or be on Broadway. Every class, every tap dancing class, every singing class, they make it. They get there and then depression, or at least malaise, or senior executives, same thing. If I just if I just make a million dollars, you know, if I just become a millionaire, then I'll feel. And the problem with all of those things is, as I said before, they are selfish. Uh, it is your goal for your reasons, which is not fulfilling for any social animal, for any human being. You know, our sense of joy and fulfillment and love and purpose comes from our ability to serve another human being. Have a child, tell me how your life changes. Fall in love, tell me how your life changes. You know, think about all the stupid things, irrational things we've done for love. We get on planes and travel around the world just to say I love you. You know, we do ridiculous things and it all feels worth it. And the sacrifices we make for a child all feel worth it, but these are no longer for us and these things will live on beyond our own lives. They are not finite, they are infinite. And there's nothing wrong with personal achievement, there's nothing wrong with setting goals, but it has to be in the context of something even bigger. And to see one's life as a continuum rather than, a, than, a, than an event is much healthier. I'm not a huge fan of the, the term self-improvement, but I do like the idea of awareness, self-awareness. You know, we all live with blind spots. We all live with missing gaps and pieces of information, which will, by the way, last for the rest of our lives. And there are some people who choose to live a life where Living with those gaps is acceptable and they never fill them in and we would say that they remain stagnant. And arguably, either mentally or physically unhealthy, you know, getting unhealthier as they get older, you know? For someone, for anyone who, who wants to be a better version of themselves, a, a more aware version of themselves, you, we, I, seek out information. And that comes in all kinds of forms, right? It can be in a relationship. Um, so for example, I went and took a listening class. I was dating someone and she accused me of being a bad listener. And I was like, you do know what I do for a living, right? Like, I'm a really good listener, so I don't know what you're talking about, you know? And then I took this listening class. Turns out I'm an absolutely brilliant listener with people who I'll never see again for the rest of my life, but amongst my friends and family, appalling. So I had this basic skill set that I never applied with the people closest to me and gave myself an out because, quote unquote, I knew how to listen. And so I realized I was a terrible listener. This was a blind spot, this was a gap. And having somebody love me tell me that didn't work, didn't believe them until you know this objective outsider, or at least I just took this class and came to this realization. That was brilliant. That awareness of the blind spot and the awareness of the skills that I need to be a better brother, son, boyfriend, friend, 
you know? I had to learn how to hold space for someone and then practice. Um, that's awareness. And I think our health is awareness. Unfortunately, some people wait for the breakup to learn that they're bad listeners. Some people wait for the heart attack to realize they're eating poorly. That's awareness. You get awareness by getting a punch in the face. I think it's a responsibility for every human being, should they want to have value in the lives of others, to seek awareness in how they show up in the world and, and how the world impacts them, their mental health, their physical health, their ability to maintain relationships and nurse relationships, for those who want to show up better in the lives of others, which is I see being healthy as a service to others. But I think we've neglected for decades the socialness of our, of our animal and social media and cell phones and, and the ubiquity of those technologies have complicated our ability to be human. And I started to realize we've confused things here, which is we don't get to decide when we're present. We get to practice being present. And so for anyone who's ever practiced meditation, there are absolutely benefits to us without a doubt. Those are important mental and physical health benefits of meditation and mindfulness, and we should practice those for sure. But there's also that what I think is the primary reason, some would consider secondary reason, which is if you practice meditation, for example, you learn to focus on one thing, your mantra, a sound, your breath, whatever it is. You learn to, you don't think of nothing, you think of one thing, you focus on one thing, right? And if something interrupts that thing, you have a thought. Did I leave the washing machine on? You label it a thought and you push it out of your head and you say, I'll deal with it later. And that's the whole idea, is total focus and the ability to put your thoughts out of your head to stay focused on this one thing. Now think about when you're sitting listening with a friend who's going through a hard time. Are you listening or are you waiting for your turn to speak? The whole meditation practice that you've been doing is now valuable in this moment, where you are focused entirely on what they're saying to you. Every distraction, every screech of a car tire outside, everybody who's talking around you, you don't hear any of it. You only hear what they're saying to you. You're entirely focused on what they're saying to you. And when you have your own thoughts of advice you'd like to give or things you want to tell them, oh my God, me too, that happened to me as well, right? You say, nope, that's not important in this moment. And you put it out of your head and deal with it later. And at the end of that conversation, your friend will say, thank you, I feel heard. Or thank you for being there for me. Or thank you for holding space for me or thank you for listening. And those are all indications that congratulations, you've been present for another. And I think what gives our lives purpose is not to wake up every morning to learn meditation so that we can be present for ourselves, though that is valuable. What gives our lives purpose is to do these things for another. There's nothing wrong with doing things and enjoying the benefit of those things yourself, by all means. But the sense of the deep feeling sense of purpose and meaning to one's life or to one's work only comes when those things are for another. And in my view, primarily for another, where our benefit is secondary. And that's where the joy and love of business, relationships, friendships come from. There's a great irony in, it, in all of this, which is to sacrifice for another really is the most beautiful thing we can ever do. I mean, that's kind of what love is. It's sacrificing for another. And all of these things, learning to be a better communicator, learning mindfulness and meditation, being in shape. If you can translate those things in for another, it, all of those things start to have a, a higher purpose. What's really the purpose of life? If you can give an insight on that. Isn't it fantastic that if there's no purpose, you have nothing to fulfill, you can just live. No, but you want a purpose. And not a simple purpose, you want a God-given purpose. It's very dangerous. People who think they have a God-given purpose are doing the cruelest things on the planet. Yes or no? They are doing the most horrible things and they've always been doing the most horrible things. Because when you have a God-given purpose, life here becomes less important than your purpose. No, life is important. Life is important. When I say life, I'm not talking about your family, your work, what you do, what you do not do, your party. I'm not talking about that as life. This is life, isn't it? Life is within you or around you. The ambience of life, you're mistaking the ambience of life for life. Your home, your family, your workspace, your party, this is all ambience of life. This is not life, isn't it? Yes or no? You're mistaking the ambience for the real thing. No. Life is important. Because it's the only thing you know. You don't know anything else. Do you know something else? 
Rest is all imagined stuff, isn't it? The only thing is that this is beating and alive and that's all there is. It is of paramount importance. Not you as a person, that's not important. But you as a piece of life, it's very important. Because that is the basis of everything. When I say that is the basis of everything, the universe exists for you only because you are, isn't it? Yes or no? The world exists for you only because you are, otherwise it wouldn't exist in your experience. So, in every way this is important. So what is the purpose for this? See, if you had a purpose and if you fulfilled it, after that what would you do? Bored, isn't it? It is just that life is so intricate and so phenomenally intricate, that if you spend ten thousand years looking at it carefully, you still will not know it entirely. If you spend a million years looking at it with absolute focus, still you will not know it in its entirety. That's how it is. There is… is there a meaning to it? The greatest thing about life is that there is no meaning to it. This is the greatest aspect of life, that it has no meaning to it and there is no need for it to have a meaning. It is the pettiness of one's mind that it is seek a meaning, because psychologically you will feel kind of unconnected with life if you don't have a purpose and a meaning. People are constantly trying to create these false purposes. Now they were quite fine and happy, Suddenly they got married, now the purpose is the other person. Then they have children, now they become miserable with each other. Now the whole purpose that I go through all this misery is because of the children. Like this it goes on. These are things that you are causing and holding these as purposes of life. And is there a God-given purpose? What if God does not know you exist? No, I'm just asking by chance. I'm saying in this huge cosmos for which God is supposed to be the creator and the manager of this hundred billion galaxies in that this tiny little planet and you, suppose he doesn't know that you exist, what to do? Possible or no? I'm sorry, I'm saying such sacrilegious things, but is it possible or no? What if he doesn't know that you exist? What if he doesn't have a plan for you? Don't look for such things. The thing is, the creation is made in such a way that creation and creator cannot be separated. Here you are a piece of creation, at the same time the source of creation is throbbing within you. If you pay little attention to this process of life, you would not need any purpose, it'll keep you engaged for a million years if you want. There is so much happening. So much means so much unbelievable things are happening right here. If you pay enough attention, a million years of existence, it'll keep you busy or more. Right now the need for purpose is come because you're trapped in your psychological structure, not in your life process. Your psychological structure functions from the limited data that it has gathered. Within that, it rolls and right now, your thought and emotion has become far more important than your life, isn't it so? So because of this, you seeking a purpose as an escape from the trap that you have set for yourself. It is a trap set by you. You can easily come out of it. If the trap was set for you by somebody else, difficult to come out because they'll set the trap in such a way that you cannot come out, isn't it? So this is a trap set by you. This is easy to come out, but that is a whole thing. Why it is so difficult is, now you're identified with the trap, you like it. You like it because it gives you a certain sense of safety and security and protection and individual identity. If you build a cocoon around yourself, it gives you safety, but it also imprisons you. Walls of 
self-preservation are also walls of self-imprisonment. When it protects you, you like it. When it restricts you, you do not like it. That is why we have doors. We like the walls because it's protecting us. But we have doors so that we can open it and get out when we want to. It doesn't matter how nice it is, we still want to go out, isn't it? So that is how it is with every trap that you set. It doesn't matter how nice it is, you still want to go out. So the psychological wall that you have built, which gives you some sense of identity, which gives you some sense of being a person, an individual person, and which gives you security, beginning to experience it like a trap, somewhere you want to break it. So one way of not breaking it is to find a purpose. Those who find a purpose in their life, they become so conceited, they will live within their own trap forever, thinking that they're doing the most fantastic thing. First thing you need is balance. If you have balance, then you can climb. If you don't have balance, it's better you stay on the ground, isn't it? It's not safe for somebody who is not balanced to climb high. It's best you stay close to the ground, you should not climb. So, first thing is to establish a balance. Then you lose in your psychological structure. Then it's a wonderful thing. If you lose in your psychological structure without balance, which a lot of people are doing today. See, why does somebody want to drink alcohol or take a drug? Because it loosens your psychological structure and makes you feel liberated for a moment. But without the necessary balance, you have not worked for the balance, but you got freedom. Freedom without balance is destruction, anarchy, isn't it? So, first thing is to work for balance, an enormous sense of balance, where even if you dismantle your psychological structure, you can simply live here. Dismantling your psychological structure is an important process because that is your trap, that is your security, that is your stability, at the same time that's your trap because the walls are set, you feel secure, but that's also your trap. If you dismantle your trap, you also dismantle your security, isn't it? You also dismantle your sense of purpose, you also dismantle everything that matters to you. So that will need balance. Without balance, if you dismantle, you will go crazy. But. Don't look for a purpose, because if you look for a purpose, you're seeking madness. If you find one, you are sure mad. Yes. If you think you found a purpose in life, you for sure gone crazy. Because only the insane people have purpose. Or people who have purpose are insane in many ways. These are things that you create in your mind and believe it's true, isn't it? Right now, fighting for my country is my purpose. Right now, if it's necessary, I will fight, knowing fully well it's an unnecessary bloody fight. Then you will fight only to the extent it's necessary. If you think this is your purpose, you would want to destroy the whole world for what nonsense you believe in, isn't it? Something is needed, we'll do it, with absolute involvement. There's no other purpose, the purpose of life is to live and to live totally. To live totally does not mean party every night. To live totally means before you fall dead, every aspect of life has been explored, nothing has been left unexplored. Yes? Before you fall dead, even if you do not explore the cosmos, at least this piece of life you must know it in its entirety. That much you must do to yourself, isn't it? That's living totally. That. You experience the whole of this, all dimensions of what this is. You did not leave anything untouched. You just do that. That will take a long time. That's enough, good enough purpose for you. So this is the nature of a human being. Whatever you're deprived of, you think that is the highest thing. Whatever you don't have, looks like at that moment, that is the highest. If you're not eaten for two days, Food will be God, yes or no? 
If you don't understand this, close your mouth, hold your nose like this for two minutes. Will you ask for air or God? God comes and says, you want me or air? You'll say, hell with you, I want to breathe. <laughs> Because whatever at that moment you're deprived of, that becomes, takes on a, enlarges itself in such a way, it blocks everything out. Or in other words, when you're in any state of compulsiveness, you don't see anything the way it is, it gets exaggerated. If your bladder is full, one minute, I am talking about enlightenment. Your bladder is very full. Are you interested? I don't want any enlightenment. Right now, going to the bathroom feels like ultimate liberation. Yes or no? So just about anything, when you're in a state of compulsiveness, you don't see anything the way it is. Life will get distorted to make you think that that is it at that moment. So like this human life passes from one, comp one compulsive state to another, never allowing yourself that little bit of space where you could see things the way they are. If you do not even see life the way it is, can you handle it the way it needs to be handled? It doesn't arise, isn't it? If you don't see things the way they are, you can never handle it the way it needs to be handled. Because of this, in many ways, individual human lives and whole societies have become distorted humanity. When I say distorted, it's normal, I mean normal. I was talking to a 14, 15-year-old kid in a school and uh, I couldn't believe that I was talking to about 11, 12 of them, young boys and girls, and something came up and I was just asking them what are they going to do next because they were in their 10th standard or something. They are only talking about finding a job and earning a living. I, I couldn't believe this because my whole life I never thought of earning a living. My dear father is to break his head. This boy has no fear in his heart. What will happen to him? What will happen? I said not having fear is a problem. I thought fear is a problem. I never thought not having fear is a problem. <laughs> According to the dictates of the divine, I was supposed to become a doctor because my father is a doctor. At the age of 10, I told him, no, that's one thing I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be a doctor. But every day, somebody is trying to work on me. You must become a doctor. You must become a doctor. You know, Indian family. You must become a doctor. If you cannot, of course, now they all shifted to software. I was in Chicago, just a, you know, eight days, just two days ago I came to India. So one week ago, eight days ago, I was in Chicago and uh, an Indian person came and I asked, okay, what are you doing? <laughs> what else Sadhguru says? That means he's a software engineer. There was a time if you said, what else, you were a doctor. Now if you say, what else, it means you're a software engineer. It is not because they are phenomenally interested in human physiology they became doctors. Not because they are, have an electronic, this thing they became a software engineer, just to earn a living. Is it not important? I'm not saying it's not important, all I'm saying is, even an ant, which is one millionth of your brain, is capable of earning a living. What's your problem with such a big brain? Why I'm saying this is, this idea, this horribly limiting idea has been imposed into the, our youths that you must earn a living and that's the biggest thing. This big brain, earning a living is actually a problem on this planet. I know everybody's been conditioned to believe that. It's not so, I'm telling you. It is not so. Earning a living is a petty thing for human consciousness. But unfortunately, all humanity is investing all its energies and intelligence in just earning a living. If this one thing does not change in the world, that I'm not saying one should not, all I'm saying is, it need not occupy the entirety of human consciousness to earn a living. If you put one little finger to work, it'll earn a living. It's capable, this is capable of that. All human genius has been smothered to death 
simply because everybody is thinking how to earn a living, how to earn a living, you know. The moment they can earn a living, they will sit down and become fat. You must be saying, what can I do with this life, isn't it? You must be saying, what is the greatest thing I can do with this life? Because one day you will fall dead, do you know? Do you know you will fall dead one day? So before you die, whatever is the peak possibility for this life should happen, isn't it? I earn my living, I earn my living. This is a big pride. Why don't you see every insect, every worm, every bird, every animal, every creature on this planet is earning a living? What is such a... What is there to be so proud of about I earn my own living? Everybody is earning their own living, isn't it? Only human beings are making a big issue out of it. Too big a issue. When I look at it, how human intelligence has been sacrificed at the altar of earning a living is unbelievable. How many things human beings could have done, how many incredible things they could have done, but instead of that they're earning a living. So it's very, very important. I'm, I'm just thinking we should start a wave, particularly in schools and colleges, that earning a living is not, is a damn little thing. It is not the prime of your life. With one little finger, you can earn a living. With this big brain, when an ant can earn its living, this big brain, should it struggle to earn a living? That has become a problem because you want to be like somebody else, isn't it? You want to be like somebody else. That enslaves you. And once you're into this chakra, nothing else is possible. It just keeps you going and going and going endlessly. Now this possibility of this simple thing called yoga is not about twisting your body, it's not about getting fit, it's not about getting healthy. This, all these things nature will do for you, if only if you live in tune with it. This is about understanding the geometry of the cosmos through the geometry of your own system. I'm calling this a geometry because Cosmos is a geometry, isn't it? Planet Earth is going around the sun. What is it? A diesel powered? You think a big diesel engine is pushing it? If it was, the roar of that engine would have killed us. Just the perfection of geometry just keeps going and going and going, isn't it? The whole universe is geometrically perfect. That's why it stays there. Otherwise, it wouldn't. And if you learn to hold your body in a certain way, if the geometry of your body is in alignment with the geometry of the rest of the creation, suddenly you will find there is a rapport, a rapport which will allow you, you can download the whole cosmos into this one. Probably these days you don't have this experience anymore, because you got all Tata Sky, Dish Net and all that stuff. But if suppose you had a television in your home in 80s when first the Durdarshan came, you are watching your favorite cricket match, suddenly your television was boom boom boom. Then you climb up the terrace and there is one aluminum contraption. If you do like this, nothing will come. If you do like this, nothing will come. You just get it to the right place. Ah, the world pours into your sitting room. This is just like that. If you learn to just hold it right, the whole cosmos will pour into you. So, engineering yourself does not mean engineering yourself to breathe little better, to be little more healthy, no. This is about realizing the full potential of what it means to be human. You're just a piece of life, aren't you? No, 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 that's not true. You're a bundle of thoughts, emotions, ideas, opinions and prejudices right now. Not a piece of life. If you sat here just as a piece of life, not as a man, not as a woman, not as this, not as that, not as a thought, not as an emotion, just a piece of life, this would naturally reverberate with the rest of the existence. 
and right now you invested too much on little things like earning a living and having this and having that and missing everything oh should i not have this should i not have that having is not the problem clinging is the problem isn't it having is not the problem what you have you become that after some time and it's happening to you every little thing that you acquire is taking your life in some way isn't it all these things we acquired thinking that these things will make our life we got these gadgets because we thought it will make our life right now this gadget has become a nuisance we can't keep our hands off it we're doing such some messaging somebody communication of course but not a communion so once you have come here you should not leave this place without knowing the full depth and dimension of what this life is about isn't it nobody should leave without knowing this because other things are subject to various realities we do not know whether you will get to run 100 meters in 8 seconds would you tr- you can't do that we do not know whether you'll climb mount everest or not we do not know whether you'll earn billion dollars or not but this much is possible you can explore the full depth and dimension of what this is because you don't need anybody's permission you don't need any kind of anything if you are willing it's there isn't it you may be willing to climb mount everest but your lungs may not be ready your legs may not be ready with this it's not like that it is not demanding any particular capability it is not demanding any particular situation only your willingness but you see your willingness comes in installments nothing wrong if you had a 10000 year life span nothing wrong fortunately you don't have that because if you hung around for 10000 years oh what a miserable world this will be you simply you may think whatever you want but it's good you have come with an expiry date have you noticed on a particular day when you when you're very joyful 24 hours just went off like a moment you're miserable and depressed one day goes like a eon so only miserable people have a long life joyful people even if they live to be 100 it's too brief before you know what's happening it'll be gone really it gets over too fast but if you're miserable you will live long so it's a very brief life and whatever is of paramount importance to this life must happen at the earliest not day after tomorrow isn't it it must be today so the life process doesn't wait you need to understand your life is just a certain combination of time and energy energy we can manage time you cannot manage it's going away it doesn't matter you're awake you're asleep you're okay you're not okay you're happy you're miserable going 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 as i'm talking you're two minutes closer to the grave time you cannot manage it's just going you can only manage your energy you can manage your activity how you make use of the time you can manage but you cannot manage time it's slipping away isn't it so if you recognize that your life is just a certain amount of time and energy you would definitely invest your energy in a way it is most meaningful to this life isn't it but if you do not understand this if you intentionally forgetful about the briefness of life and you go about as if you're eternal yes you are eternal aren't you on a daily basis you're not aware that life will end for me and it could be today not to be terrified just to be in tune with the fundamental facts of life that it is possible that our lives could end today isn't it possible we are not intending 
we are not seeking that but it's possible isn't it if you miss this then you'll miss your whole life if you do not understand that you have an expiry date and it is not even fixed like a pharmaceutical product that you have another 2 years to live it could be just about any time if you miss this one fundamental fact you are sure to miss your whole life because everything that's vital will be tomorrow and tomorrow never happens there is a a certain superstition in south india maybe it is here also particularly in karnataka where on all the village homes in red paint it will be written nale ba nale ba means come tomorrow they write it in red paint because devils will come wanting to enter your house and they can see only red you didn't know this because they're looking for your blood they can see only red color so it's painted in red bay paint now le ba devil comes to your house and says okay this house is tomorrow and goes away but the fact is most human beings have done this not to the devil but to the divine if you've done it to the devil it's okay but you've done it to the divine it seems it's <laughs> tomorrow will meditate tomorrow so knowing life is not some superhuman effort if you stop being some other rubbish and just become life which is what you are knowing life is not far away it's right here i want to talk about change change and transition Any changes that we're going to do at all have to come from within ourselves. They absolutely must. And change to me means that you change from a feeling of separation and isolation and loneliness and anger and fear and pain and into a state of peacefulness. Wonderful peacefulness where you can relax and really enjoy life as it comes to you. knowing that everything will be all right life is wonderful and that everything is perfect in my world and i move into my greater good always and that way it doesn't really matter to me which direction my life takes because i know it's going to be wonderful so i can enjoy all sorts of things you know gerald jampolski says that love is letting go of fear and there is either fear or there's love and if you're not in a love space If you're not coming from the loving space of the heart, then you're in fear and all those other things like isolation and separation and things like that and loneliness and anger. They're all part of the fear syndrome. And that's really what we want to change from. We want to move from fear into love and to make that as more or less a permanent state for us. You know, even the planet itself these days is very much in this period of change and transition. We see it all around us. We're going from an old order into a new order. And some people say it began with the Aquarian age, and the at least the astrologers like to describe it that way. But you know, to me, astrology and numerology and palmistries and all those other various methodologies are just ways of describing life. They explain life in a slightly different way. and people use different language to do this but the astrologers say that we're moving out of the piscean age and into the aquarian age now and you know in the piscean age we reached outside of us and looked to other people to save us we looked for other people to do it for us but in the aquarian age which we're entering now people are beginning to go within and find that they have the power to save themselves And this is a wonderful liberating thing for us. Now some people get very frightened because it seems to be responsibility. But actually we're discovering our ability to respond to life not in a victim way, but in a way that gives us power. To the way that gives us power. 
we're finding that we're getting a connection to what the AA people call the higher power and what I call our higher self so that we can contribute to saving ourselves. And it's a wonderful feeling when you don't really have to be dependent on an outside person, but to know that you have within you tremendous abilities to make positive changes in your life. You see, if we're victims, then we feel isolated, we feel in pain and fear, and we're always looking for someone else to do it for us. But now we're taking, as I said, responsibility for our own lives, and we're beginning to understand how we can contribute to the experiences that we have and how we can change those experiences if we don't really care for them. And of course, you know, from the moment you decide to make a change until you get your demonstration, as we call it, or when you get what you want, we have this transitional period. And that's when we're moving between the old order and the new order. It's a time of releasing old beliefs and old habits and of learning and practicing and then living the things that we're working on. The new beliefs or the new feelings or the new methods or the new behaviors. And while you're getting those in place so that they are a natural part of your life, you're going to have a lot of vacillating in that period between the old and the new. And you go back and forth between what you, what was and what you, what you would like to be or what you would like to have. And if you decide that you're going to release an old belief and that you're going to create a new one, during that transitional period, you're going to go back and forth. And this is a time when we often get very angry at ourselves because it's like, well, I know all about the new, why aren't I doing it? I must not be good enough or I must be a bad person. But that's silly because anything that we're learning takes time and you go back and forth and back and forth until you're really strong in the new belief, until you've gone to the complete shift. You know, you may begin to do an affirmation for something and you're doing well and then something happens and you say, oh, I can't do that. And you go back to your old worry habit again. Well, that's just a period of vacillating. It doesn't mean that you haven't learned anything and it doesn't mean that you're back where you started. It's just part of that back and forth thing. You're not settled in your new habit yet. And that takes a little time and a little practice and a little patience. And you want to be patient with yourself. Be patient with yourself. You know, you want to build yourself up instead of beating yourself up. There's a tremendously different image if you just think of it. Do your thoughts build you up or do they beat you up? When you beat yourself up, you know, that's not being very loving to yourself. Sometimes we don't need to make outward changes so much as to go within and just sort of take what we already do and alter it just a little bit. Somebody was saying to me tonight that they were thinking about a new apartment and they were worrying that there wouldn't be enough money. And I said, well, why don't you start affirming there will be lots of money? And you know, it's just like a tiny little thing and you almost change two words, but it's a small way of changing the way you look at a particular situation. Somebody was asking me, uh, saying that they were in a, a lot of pain and you know, they kept using the word pain so much. And they said, is there another word that I could use? And I thought of the time that I smashed my finger with an, um, a window and I realized that if I really gave into it, I was going to go through a very difficult period. So the minute it happened, I started to do some mental work right away. But then I remember I was referring to my finger as having a lot of sensation. And you know, by insisting upon viewing it in that particular way, to me, I think helped it heal much quicker and helped me handle what could have been an incredibly painful thing because I knew that if I could alter my mind, it would be better. If we can just alter the way we think just a little bit. So those of us who want to change, we're moving from an old order to a new order, and lots and lots of things are happening on this planet. I don't think things on the planet are so very different than they used to be, but we seem to be more aware of things. I see things in the paper all the time and I think, oh my goodness, are we really doing that? 
And then as I continue to read, it seems like we've been doing it for a long time, but it's coming to the surface. We seem to see more negativity. But you know, if you want to clean your own mental house, if you decide to work on yourself and you're going to go inside, you have to look and see what is there. You have to look and see what your beliefs are so you know what to change. You can't clean out the negativity if you don't see it. If you're going to clean your own house, it's the same thing. You have to look around and see where the dirt is. You have to pick things up and dust them and look around and polish them or throw them out or replace them. But you have to see what's there. And if we're going to make a big transitional phase on this planet and really help to heal this planet, we're going to have to look and see what's occurring here. We're going to have to see what's happening and to uncover the negativity. And the things that have been hidden for a long time are going to come to the surface. You know, I really want to help create a world where it's safe for us to love each other. That's all. Just to love each other. A world where we can be loved and accepted exactly as we are. That's what you wanted when you were a little child. When you were little, you wanted to be loved just as you were, even if you were too skinny or too heavy or if you weren't smart enough or you weren't like the person across the street, or maybe you were scared, but you still wanted to be loved. And it's the same thing we're all looking for now, only we're not going to get this love and acceptance from other people unless we can give it to ourselves. When we feel good enough to be loved, then others will love and accept us too. It's really that simple. I think that we come to this planet to learn and to practice unconditional love. And it's not always an easy thing to do, but I think that's what we've come here for. To have unconditional love, first of all, for ourselves, no matter what they said or what they did to us in the past. And also to give that same unconditional love to other people, to just allow them to be who they are and to get rid of this them and us because it's not them and us, it's all us. And we need to know that. And if we're gonna heal this planet, we have to know it's all us. And there are no groups that are expendable, and there are no groups that are less than. I know not what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And I want to tell you, I've been guided by the light of God's grace my entire life. People ask, what's the secret to my success? It's because I lean into His grace. Because life is always talking to us. And this is what I do know. When you tap into what it's trying to tell you, when you can get yourself quiet enough to listen, I mean really listen, you can begin to distill the still small voice, which is always representing the truth of you from the noise of the world. And you can start to recognize when it comes your way. You can learn to make distinctions, to connect, to dig a little deeper. You'll be able to find your own voice within the still small voice. You'll begin to know your own heart and figure out what matters most when you can listen to the still, small voice. Every right move I've made has come from listening deeply and following that still, small voice. Aligning myself with its power, with the source of power, so that when I walk into a room just as cool as you please, and the fellas either stand or fall down on their knees and they say, that's a phenomenal woman. And when I walk into that room, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Because everybody that's ever come before me walks into that room with me. My great, great grandfather, Constantine Winfrey, born an enslaved man and couldn't write or smell his, spell his name, but 10 years after the Emancipation Proclamation had learned to read 
and had picked 10,000 bales of cotton in exchange for 80 acres of land and became the first person in my American lineage to own his own property. I come as one, I stand as 10,000 has been my mantra for power because for so many of my earlier years when I was the only, I was the only woman, I was the only person of color, the one nobody expected to be in the room at the table on the anchor desk, co-anchoring the news here in Nashville in 1975 walking into boardrooms in the 80s, negotiating deals to own my own show. Not just do the show, but to make as much money from it as they were gonna make off of me. And at no time did I ever feel out of place or not enough or inadequate or an imposter. Do not let the world make an imposter syndrome out of you. Why? Because I knew who I was. And more importantly, I knew whose I was. I didn't know the future, but I knew who was in charge of the future. And my job, just as your job is, to align with God's dream for you. And my prayer was always, use me, use me, God. Show me how and who you need me to be. Because this is what I will tell you. God can dream a bigger dream for you than you could ever imagine for yourself. I am living testimony of aligning and living history. But my job today is to help you to commence to the next part of your dream odyssey. So let's talk about the right moves for that. I've been thinking a lot about how much of your lives have already been spent grappling with the extreme complex, complex issues of our time because you are the generation that is forced to depend on body cams to obtain justice. And even then, accountability, as we've seen again and again, can be so hard to come by. You've witnessed the storming of the Capitol and the death of civility. You're acutely aware that voting rights are being gutted, women's rights are being dismantled, books are being banned, history is being rewritten, the Supreme Court is being corrupted, the debt ceiling is being held hostage, the climate is changing, the LGBTQ community, LGBT plus community is under attack, the Cold War is back. The leaders are behaving like children. The children are being gunned down by military-grade assault rifles. We live on a planet where there is more than enough wrong to keep you busy trying to make things right for the rest of your natural life. And unfortunately, you're going to encounter people who will insist that it's not actually possible to make any real difference. But I believe Tennessee has a couple of Justins just a few miles from here who would respectfully disagree. Representatives like Justin Jones and Justin J. Pearson are using their lives to prove the cynics wrong, and they're building on the legacy of giants, mentors of mine like John Lewis, whose fight for justice started right here in Nashville, and who now speaks to us from eternity. Well, this is what I know for sure. There will never be anything in your life as fulfilling as making a difference in somebody else's. Everybody here wants to see you take your integrity, your curiosity, your creativity, your guts, and this newfound education of yours, and use it to make a difference. Everybody always thinks you gotta go do something big and grand. I'll tell you where you start. You start by being good to at least one other person every single day. Just start there. That's how you begin to change the world, by just being good to one other person. It doesn't matter if it's a member of your tribe or a stranger on the street. I'm here to tell you that a little act of compassion can be a lifesaver for somebody who receives it, but also for you who offers it. Just extend yourself in love and kindness to somebody. And as my dear friend Maya always said, Love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles, it leaps fences, it penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope. And when you step out in love, you become someone's hope. And I know that becoming hope in the world won't always be easy. There'll be times when you get to your wits end, but there's another old proverb that says, when you get to your wits end, remember that's where God lives. I would add that when you get to your wit's end, it's also a good idea to remember 
that you've been there before because we are among the toughest, most resilient people the world has ever seen. And I'm just not talking about older generations. Your generation has masked up and locked down for a pandemic that ravaged the world. You, my TSU friends, have trained for complicated times. And I don't care how hard life after college gets, and it's gonna get hard. We need you to dream big. We need audacious thinkers. Use my example. I was one good TSU teacher, Mr. Cox, and one timely phone call away from a career that would absolutely change my life. That story's not just my own. What dream are you one or two steps away from? We also need generosity of spirit. We need high standards and open minds and untamed imagination. That's how you make a difference in the world, using who you are and what you stand for to make changes big and small. And there will be times when making the next right decision will be scary. I'll tell you a secret. That's how I've gotten through every challenge without being overwhelmed by asking, what is the next right move? You don't have to know all the right moves. You just need to know the next one. And it's okay to be scared. In fact, if you weren't scared, I'd be scared for you. But let me repeat something that the most extraordinary, certainly one of the most extraordinary men I've ever known said, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. Let your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. To me, that's a nine word prayer. And it came from a single individual who literally changed the world by putting his own fears aside for the people of his country. Thank you, Nelson Mandela. Now you all have photos to bomb and diplomas to frame, heels to change out of. I don't know how you walk in in them heels, Trinity. Neckties to hand to your next of kin. But I can't just tell you what desperate shape the universe is in and send you on your way. So I'm going to leave you with this instead. The world is weaning itself off Russian fuel. Electric cars are going mainstream across the globe. That hole we punched in the ozone layer is healing. Ukraine is still in there fighting for us all. Finland joined NATO. COVID is currently receding. And there are human beings who very quietly donate their bone marrow to strangers. And this, to me, signals that the United States of America may not be united, but we are not a finished product. My point is, anything is possible. The wheels are still in spin. Saints walk among us. And as Nelson Mandela so brilliantly demonstrated, it's better to be hopeful than fearful, if for no other reason than the fact that hope brings us one step closer to joy. And I leave you with this. You have been prayed for and paid for, not just tuition, but paid for through the sacrifices, through the daily aggressions, through the discriminations, the locked doors, the back doors, the barriers broken down, through the humiliations, working two and three jobs, just trying to make ends meet and getting you a little money so you can have something to spend in college. Every family member from generations back who helped make this day possible, you owe them a rising. And your job is to come on up to the rising, to meet the rising of your life. I'm here to tell you that you actually do get to transform the world every day by your actions. Small steps lead to big accomplishments. And I'm here to tell you that your life isn't some big break like everybody thinks it is. They're waiting on the big break. It's actually about taking one significant life transforming step at a time. So you can pick a problem, literally any problem. The list is long because there's gun violence and economic inequality and there's media bias and the homeless need opportunity and the addicted need treatment and the dreamers need protection. The prison system needs to be reformed. The social safety net needs saving. Misogyny needs to stop. And the truth is you cannot fix everything, but what you can do here and now is make a decisions because life is about 
decisions. And the decision is that you will use your life in service, you will be in service to life, and you will speak up, you will show up, you will stand up, you will sit in, you will volunteer, you will vote, you will shout out, you will help, you will lend a hand, you will offer your talent and your kindness however you can, and you will radically transform whatever moment you're in, which leads to bigger moments. Because the truth is, success is, it's, it's a process. You can ask anybody who's been successful. And so service is not just about when you're getting served, it's truly everything. You know, I started my talk show. I was just so happy to be on television. And I was one day interviewing members of the Ku Klux Klan. I thought I was interviewing them so that I could expose their vitriol to the world. I saw them giving signals to each other in the audience and I thought, hmm, something's going on here. And I realized they were using me, they were using the platform for themselves. So I said to my producers afterwards, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Then we did a show where someone was embarrassed and it was my fault. I was responsible for the embarrassment. For some crazy reason, we talked to a man who was cheating on his wife to come to the show with the woman he was cheating on and his wife. And he said yes. And while there on live television, he says to his wife that his girlfriend is pregnant. That happened on my watch. And when that happened, shortly after I'd interviewed the Klan and experienced that, I said, I'm not gonna do that again. So I started to ask the question, how can I use this show to not just be a show, but to allow it to be a service to the viewer? And that question of how do we serve the viewer transform the show. And because we asked that question every single day from 1989 forward, with the intention of only doing what was in service to the people who were watching. It is why no matter where I go in the world, on any given day, somebody comes up to me and says, I watched your show. It changed my life. I've been watching since I was five years old until I went from DVR to, <laughs> to VCRs to now streaming. People watch and were raised by that show. I did a good job of raising a lot of people, I must say. And that happened because of an intention to be of service. So I live in this space of radical love and gratitude. Truly, I have, I, I feel, the most beautiful life that you can imagine. I sit around trying to think of who could have a better life. And I will tell you, Whatever you imagine my life to be like, I wonder what Oprah's doing right now. It's always 10 times better than whatever you think. It's true. And it's because, not because I have wealth, which is great. It's, money's fabulous, I love it. And I get a lot of attention and that's also good sometimes. But it's because I had appreciation for the small steps the seeds that were planted, the map and flow of my life that unfolded because I was paying attention. You have to pay attention to your life because it is speaking to you all the time. And the bumps in the road and the failures that pointed me in a new, dire new direction and led me to a path made clear. That is what I'm wishing for you today, your own path made clear. And I know that there is a lot of anxiety, a lot about what the future holds and how much money you're gonna make. But your anxiety does not contribute one iota to your progress, I'm here to tell you. It does the opposite. Look at how many times you worried and you were upset and you didn't think you were gonna make it through the block. I got that text a couple months ago. And here you are today, you made it. And I'm here to tell you that you're going to be more than okay. So take a deep breath with me right now. 
and repeat this. Everything is always working out for me. I want to hear it. Everything is always working out for me. That's my mantra. Make it yours. Everything is always working out for me because it is and it has and it will continue to be as you forge and discover your own path. But first, you do need a job. Yep, you need a job. And may I say, it does not have to be your life's mission, not your greatest passion, not your most fulfilled self, but a job that pays your rent. Yes, and lets you move out of your parents' house. Look who's applauding. Because yes, they are tired of taking care of you and are hoping that this CC fine education you received is going to pay off. And it will, it will, I promise you, in ways that today you cannot even imagine. You know, for years I've been talking about, and I've done a lot of graduations, and I do a lot of lecturing, talking at the table, exchanges with the girls, and we talk about passion and purpose and realizing your dream. And uh, I realized that I was confusing them uh, and their expectations were out of whack. One of my daughter girls who graduated two years ago came out of school with a job that she'd previously interned. She bought her own used car, has an apartment she shares with run only one roommate, all with no help from me. And she'd only been working about six months, calls me and says, Mama, they want to give me a promotion but I don't think I want the promotion because I don't think it fulfills my purpose. And I said, your purpose right now is to keep that job. Your purpose is to do what you have to do until you can do what you want to do. I borrowed that line from the great debaters. So here's the truth. For years, I had a job. And through that job, doing a lot of things that I actually didn't want to do, I got demoted and discovered my life's calling. So I was on the air as a reporter. My job ended when I was 28 years old, but I'd been working in radio, got my first job in radio at 16, was hired in television at 19. And it was a job because every day I felt like, I don't know if this is really what I'm supposed to be doing. But my father was like, you better keep that job. So. When I was 28, it wasn't working out for me on the news because I was too emotional. I'd go to cover stories and cry because people lost their houses or lost their children. I was told that I was going to be taken off the evening news and put on a talk show. That was a demotion for me at the time that actually worked out for me. So I would like to say that many times Many times there are things that look like failure in your life. And I want to clear up because for years at every graduation, I've said, there's no such thing as failure. Well, it is. I've said, it's no such thing as failure. It's just life pointing you into a different direction. It does, it indeed does. But in the moment when you fail, it really feels bad. And it's embarrassing and it's bad. <laughs> And it's going to happen to you if you keep living. But I guarantee you, it also will pass and you will be fine. Why? Because everything is always working out for you. So I realized this when I was in the struggle of my life. I tried to build a network at the same time I was still trying to do a show. And I did not have the right leadership. Everything is about having people in the right positions to support you. And so I had to take a good long look at myself when everything in the media, because all of my mistakes are on the evening news or the CNN crawl, I can't do anything privately. So in every news story, when every story is about struggle, 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 I had to have a talk with myself and say, what is this really about? What is this here to show you? My favorite question when in crisis, what is this here to teach or show me? Jeff Weiner, one of my friends and founder of LinkedIn, says that failure is what's going to humble you. It helps you realize how fleeting success can be. 
at least traditional measures of, of success because you realize that to some extent how it is just beyond your control and you invest less in it in terms of the way you define yourself. Success in terms of achieving objectives, in terms of manifesting a mission, in terms of manifesting a vision, that's all good, especially if what you do can create good in the world. But to the extent that you start to define yourself through traditional measures of success, to the extent that that's your source of self-esteem, you're destined to be unhappy because you cannot control it. Jack Canfield, another one of my thought leaders that I admire, says, the greatest wound we've all experienced is somehow being rejected for being our authentic self. And as a result of that, we then try to be what we're not to get approval, love, protection, safety, money, whatever that is. And the real need for all of us really is to reconnect with the essence of who we really are, reown all the disowned parts of ourselves, whether it's our emotions, our spirituality, whatever. We all go around hiding parts of ourselves. He says he was with a Buddhist teacher a number of years ago, and that teacher said, here's the secret. If you were to meditate for 20 years, this is where you'd finally get to. Just be yourself, but be all of you. So I've made a living, not a living, but a real life from being true to myself, using the energy of my personality to actually serve the purpose of my soul. And that purpose I'm here to tell you gets revealed to you daily. It is not just one thing. It is the thread that is connecting the dots of everything that you do. So when I first started television at 19, as I said, I was just happy to have a job. But later, through experience, trial, error, some failures, recognized that my true purpose was to be an inspiration and a force for good to allow people to see the best of themselves through the work and the stories that we were able to tell. And so that becomes my legacy. I remember when I finished the school and I had gone to my mentor friend, Maya Angelou's house. Maya was making biscuits and she was teaching me how to make the biscuits. And I said, Maya, I'm so sorry you weren't there for the opening of the school. She said, oh babe, I know it must have been beautiful. I said, yes, that school is going to be my greatest legacy. And she said, you have no idea what your legacy will be. I said, oh, no, no, Maya, the school, that's it, the school. Those girls, that's going to be my le legacy. And she said, as she put down the dough, you have no idea what your legacy will be. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, because your legacy is every life that you touch. And that... I repeat everywhere because it's true. It's not one thing, it's everything. And the most important thing is how you touch other people's lives. Every day you're carving out the path, even when it looks like you're not. All your actions are creating equal and opposite reactions, which is the third law of motion in physics. What you put out is coming back. How you think and what you do is already being done unto you. That is my religion. I live by that. This whole idea of quantum physics, physics, Newton's law, nature, the way, the order of things, and how life and nature itself operates. And I could see a reflection of my own self, my own being in all of that. And reading Newton's law, third law of motion, which says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, was like a religious experience for me. I just understand, I mean, all my bells and whistles and lights and dancing emojis went off because I could see that. I'd experienced a little bit of that in The Color Purple, that beautiful line where Whoopi, as Miss Seeley says, everything you try to do to me is already done to you. That struck me in particular in the movie. 
And I understood that everybody's actually saying the same thing. Newton's saying the same thing as Miss Seeley is saying the same thing as what we in this country and many other countries call the golden rule, that really what you put out is coming back all the time. And what really struck me is that it's not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It really is when you do, it's already done because that's law. How did you turn your pain into purpose? Well, before the pain became a purpose, it was just an acknowledgement of what had happened to me. And one of the things we talk about in the What Happened to You book is that anything that has happened to you, and I wanted to just make this point to everybody, there's not a black woman in this room who hasn't been through something that helped her build strength and then something else that helped you build strength, and then something else that helped you build strength. I mean, sometimes you go through so much, you say, God, don't teach me nothing else new today. I don't need no more strength building. But, but this is what I know, is that strength times strength times strength times strength. Every time you got stronger, you were building power because strength times strength times strength times strength equals powerful. So we're sitting in a room amongst ourselves with all of these powerful women who have their stories of what happened to you that you can now turn into post-traumatic wisdom. So what I was able to do was to take what had happened to me and to use it as an empathy builder for myself and for other people. And it is my empathy and connection that has allowed me to be the woman that I am today. And so, Anything that has happened to you, if you are willing to learn from it, to open up and no longer allow the stigma and shame to cause you to hide your secrets, but to know that your vulnerability is where your real strength lies and take that pain and turn it into something meaningful for yourself. And as Maya used to say, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now, not even the sexual abuse, the sexual assault, you know, when I was raped, I didn't even know, I didn't even know what a penis was. And like so many other people in this room who were also sexually assaulted when they were young, I didn't tell anybody because I knew it would be turned on me. I knew I was not in a safe environment where other adults would trust my word. And so I kept it to myself until I was on, literally on an Oprah Winfrey show. Somebody shared their story of abuse and I was like, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only person who had been raped at nine and molested until, until I was 14. So I think being able to take your pain and turn it into purpose and power begins first with being able to empathize with other people who've been through the same kind of pain. And everything that's happened to you has also happened for you, if you allow it to be. There's not one thing that has happened to you that you cannot now turn into something that is useful and meaningful in the life that you are now leading forward.